Welcome to the mind of Lance Skurve, the most creatively profound man in cyberspace. Welcome everyone back to Lance Skurve of LanceGurve.com. Always make sure to go to LanceGurve.com because everything we do here on this particular social media platform is not everything that we do. We have all types of content and I welcome you every time. You can never be bored. If you feel bored, come on over to LanceGurve.com. Anyway, I'm always thinking. I would say that I'm a deep thinker. Now that's relative because my deepest thoughts might be something elementary to someone else. But in my journey, I just seek to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the reflections on human nature. That's my first love from very young. I remember when my mother went back to college. She'd already had her degrees, Juilliard School of Music, so many different things and accomplishments. And she went back and she would have these books on psychology. And I would love to go into those books and just look through things and learn the terms and what they meant and apply them to real life. And she explained a lot to me, even before she was going back to school. So how people react with each other, how they act as an adult, how they act as a child, the things and wrap the factors around them that made them to be what they are. And then we have our own propensity, personality traits, things that make us unique, that if you put two people, two different people in the same set of circumstances, you'd have different reactions. Some of us are stronger in certain areas and some of them need to be stronger in different areas in life. So that always fascinated me. So as I move throughout my day and meet new people and deal with some of the same people that I've known for years, it's a study and it's really a science to me. And it's a science that we all need to indulge ourselves in, not just to understand people around us, but also to, to understand ourselves. So we can go up under the hood because nobody knows us better than ourselves. In the intricate tapestry of human development, the foundation laid in childhood echoes throughout adulthood, shaping our perceptions, behaviors, and emotional landscapes. Central to this foundation are two fundamental pillars, genuine love and a nurturing home environment. When these pillars are absent or deficient, a profound void emerges, casting a shadow that often extends into adulthood, manifesting in various forms of dysfunction and dissatisfaction. That was taught to me very young. I've always known that what happens in your childhood has a profound effect on the rest of your life. And when I meet new people, if it's in general, I really don't have the right to ask them about their childhood, but the things that they share about their childhood, if you ask them something innocent and they volunteer information even deeper, those coordinates could tell you a lot about them, especially in business, especially in relationships, especially if they're going to live close to you. You need to know what's around you. And I have my formulas and sometimes my own uh, invented formulas on dealing with human nature sometimes may be a little off. So I have to go up under the hood sometimes and tweak it a little bit. But you combine that with a discerning spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third eye, whatever you want to call it, like I always say in every single show, you really can't go wrong. You can't make a split second decision on appearance or certain factors that may throw you off. But after a time, like two boxers in the boxing ring who never fought each other, they pick, it, pick up each other's rhythm and then they could begin to dissect each other's strategy and we'll see who is the winner. But with this, there is no winner and loser. Um, yeah, you can say they're losers if you don't look within yourself to correct the certain things that you may have needed. You may have to be the one to supply those things that have left you with voids. It may not be for someone else to do so. Lots of times we have people who meet someone else and they see something in that person that looks to be very nutritious to add on to what they didn't get to fill that void. And sometimes if that other person has a wayward mentality or doesn't have the best in their heart for you, they will hook you with what you think you needed from them 
and they will give it to you piece by piece and they will lure you into a whole different trajectory in your life and manipulate you. There's a lot of things we have to talk about and there's a lot of things we have to concern ourselves with as we move about some this oftentimes shark infested waters of life. Now, I don't have a doom and gloom mentality toward life, but the bottom line is that we have to be equipped because we don't even know what it is we're dealing with. We talk about using condoms and, and safe sex, but what about the spiritually transmitted demons around us that we're moving around with unprotected and we get infected with their demons dealing with them without even laying a hand on them? So it's not just a physical thing with intimacies. It's a spiritual thing and it's a mental thing. A mentality could be influenced by those around us who don't care for us but want to manipulate us to what they want out of us. And when they get what they want, they're gone. Come on. A lot of us have been abandoned that way. A lot of us have been betrayed that way to find out that what was around us was not as sincere as they tried to act. So we got to be very careful. And that's all I said. Let's just be very careful in what we deal with. But I want to start out with a few points that I jotted down. I want to talk about it. And I'll talk about each one. What every child needs. Number one, unconditional love. A child thrives when they receive love without conditions or expectations fostering a sense of security and self-worth. You can't demand something out of a child. You can't put conditions on a child. But oftentimes when a child is born into the world, is born into a dysfunctional situation and they are made or heavily influenced to take one side or another or to have a certain ideology over another, whether it be, be religious, whether it be to favor one person in the family over the other, or to be added into a pre-existing duel between two parents or family members. They learn quickly that they have to take one side or the other, and the hand that feeds them usually is the one who wins out. Number two, emotional stability. A stable and supportive environment where emotions are acknowledged, understood, and validated is crucial for healthy emotional development. Emotional stability, a supportive environment. Your emotions must be acknowledged and not brushed off. If you were a child and your, your emotions or your concerns or your hurts were brushed off, you're made to feel insignificant. And this can take, let's just look at it this way. When you deal with concrete and you lay down a concrete sidewalk or you're building a wall with cinder blocks and you're putting the concrete between you have a bit of time to mold it and shape it the way you want. But after a time, it hardens and it stays that way. And oftentimes you have to take a sledgehammer to change it and crack it down. That's the way we are. See, when we come into the world, we are moldable. There is a time where we can be guided and righteously manipulated, not unrighteously manipulated, but righteously manipulated into doing and being the right thing. But when you come up in a situation where your feelings are dismissed and they don't acknowledge them, you begin to feel less than you should feel about yourself. Therefore, when you get older and someone acknowledges your emotions, oh, you accept them and embrace them and take them into your life hook, line, and sinker, and that could be dangerous. Remember, there are a lot of emotional vampires out here who seek and destroy innocent people who are victims because they don't know where the cracks in their armor are. If you take time to work on yourself and work on those cracks in the armor, not just the cracks in the armor to protect yourself from the outside, but also finding healthy ways to fill those voids on the inside. So it's a multifaceted attack. But see, most of us don't think this way. We just react. We leap from one relationship to the next relationship, not thinking, who are we dealing with here? Where are our spiritual condoms? But just jumping into something, I was listening to a live stream on TikTok today. There's a young lady who's very sensible, who's really nice. And, and she she's not old, but she's younger than I. But she's probably 45, 40, 45 or something like that. She understands life, put it this way. But one thing that shocked me about her was when she says, we make things too complicated in our relationships. And she said that. You know, we, we and she was basically speaking about the things that I feel are correct. It may not have to go that way or go in that particular timeline, but about dating and courting and engagement and marriage. It's a process. We are a layered people. 
We just can't see somebody and like them and just commit to a lifelong commitment. Those first few layers sometimes take time to come off before you see what's really internal with this person that they're not telling you that they may not want to deal with. So you just can't, well, you like me and I like you and we wait a couple of months and then we just jump into it. You can't do that because that's a recipe for disaster. And I was quite surprised that she would say something like that. I'm not going to say who her name was. You probably wouldn't even know her anyway. I'm not putting it down that way. But there's so many people on social media right now sharing their ideologies. And it's a wonderful thing because it's a way for us to sharpen our emotional and spiritual swords. But I was really surprised. You don't just jump into something because I like you, you like me, uh uh-uh. Because it's easy to get in and it's hard to get out. And most often people are not transparent. They're not going to show themselves completely. They're going to hold something back. Oh, we're going to have a show about that too. We're going to talk about that in depth. Number three, nurturing relationships. Meaningful connections with caregivers, family members, and peers provide essential and social and emotional nourishment. See, when you have these nurturing relationships, it's a give and take. It validates you. And with different people, the caregivers, the family members, and the peers, you know where you fit in. You kind of triangulate who you are. You see what I mean? Like, you'll know if you're off in something because caregivers and family members and friends, they will let you know, hey, that was a little off. And you adjust yourself. You don't get upset. But if you don't have these types of relationships young and maybe you're isolated because of the circumstances or you isolated yourself because you're hurt from something or maybe not being acknowledged in your emotions, you don't want to get hurt again. This thing, it it continues to grow. And I hate to say the word social misfit, but you can find yourself in a position of being a social misfit where you don't know how to fit in. And sometimes you get angry by not knowing how to fit in and you push yourself in. You don't have manners. You don't want to follow the rules. You still have hurt inside you. I know a lot of grown adults this way. And they end up being alone because they don't want to take time and learn what they should have learned if they had those caregivers, friends, and family members around them to validate who they are. Number four, safety and security. Physical safety and a sense of security within the home create a stable foundation for growth and exploration. Yes, I always speak about this in the home that I grew up in, that my parents provided for me, very nurturing, very safe. I always speak about the pleasant ache that I had in my heart growing up because I did feel physically safe. I felt the love. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and hear my parents giggling and talking and telling jokes with each other. And even though I wasn't part of that particular conversation and I was the next room over, it let me know there was real love in that household. And it just made me, it made me feel real good in my home. And that's something I've carried around with me like a doggy bag. Like when you eat uh, too much at the restaurant and you want to take it home with you, listen, I get a doggy bag. Okay, I'll pack it up for you. Well, I've been carrying that doggy bag around with me for life. And there have been situations that I've been in in life that were quite trying to my psyche and to my soul. And people that know me, they say, man, you're strong. I might be a little strong, but I have enough saturation of love inside my heart from growing up that has buffered me from these things happening that would damage me. It protected me. It was like an exoskeleton. It was like a shell. It was like an armor. Because you know life is not like this, and you can go back to your childhood and say, this is the way it should be. And then you replicate that in your home as you get older. But those things and knowing those things help you to know right from wrong and the way things should be because you felt that good feeling and you know that it can be. Many people don't know it and some people unfortunately will never know it. And that's sad. But when they see it, they know exactly what it is. So if you do have it, continue to exude that feeling to the world so that those that are lost or empty or full of voids can gravitate toward toward you and, and use you as a measure, right? As a standard to say, you know what? I want to have my home just like this. Number five, boundaries and structure. Clear boundaries and consistent routines offer children guidance and a sense of predictability, promoting healthy boundaries in relationships later in life. And it's not just the boundaries to keep them in. No, 
but they learn this blueprint when they get older. I've known people who I kind of half know that you kind of half, you know, think they're all right. They're decent people. And they come over to your house and you let them in and they sit down in the living room. And you say, Hey, listen, I'll be right back. And you go downstairs in your basement, in your backyard and, and, and you see them when you come back in, you don't see them. You say, Hey, you know, where are you? Oh, 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 I'm upstairs. I just wanted to um, check out your bedroom. Man, you got some nice clothes in here. Your wardrobe is really nice. See, that's somebody who wasn't taught boundaries. You don't go in people's house and do that. Even people I've known for decades, I would not do that to them unless they invited me to that part of the house to show me something. You see, these are things that you didn't know in childhood. See, and it's evident. And those things still, you get to a certain age, you should already know. But those things irk me. They do. And I could say, well, they didn't know any better, but there's a point where you have to know better because as you get to be older and more mature, you're going to run into situations that are going to, going to be self-correcting where people are going to say, hey, you don't do this. And this particular individual, he didn't come around that much. I didn't know him like for decades, whatever, but on other levels, he was pretty good, but he just didn't know the boundaries. He did that to me one more time again. And after that, I didn't have him come over anymore. I didn't just say you can't come over. But the bottom line, I avoided that and deflected that and it worked its way out. He, he was inflicting his uh, uh, lack of boundaries on other people. And they came back and complained to me. You know, I mean, I went to the bathroom. He was over and I came back and he was in the kitchen eating. And the microwave was on when I had a microwave because microwave is no good for you. But he had a, the microwave. And, oh, man, that macaroni and cheese is good, man. But it's a vegan macaroni and cheese. You know, it, it tastes better than the, than the one with the milk and the cheese. I was like, wow, because I had a pot of it and there was something else in the fridge that he put in the microwave. But took, took time and, and did this. Like, wait a second, you, you don't do this. <laughs> no. What happens if you um have your significant other laying in the bed half nude, enjoying her sleep with the door closed? She doesn't have to lock it. And this joker comes over. And um, you go out to the side of the house to take out the garbage and, you know, one can spills and you have to take time to put the garbage back and everything. And you come back inside the house and he's trying to jump on your wife or he's feeling her up and she's thinking it's you. That's death right there. But anyway, what I'm saying is that when people don't have boundaries, you don't know what they'll do. You don't know what they'll do. They can treat you nice and everything, get into your life and just find themselves places. And that's just examples in the home. What about how they treat you or the liberties they take is very important. And it's very important for you to know as a child so nobody takes advantage of you. Very important. Number six, encouragement and validation. Recognition of achievements, efforts, and individual strengths builds confidence and resilience. Yes, it does. Listen, you all know I'm an artist. I draw. I love to draw. A certain style of drawing I do, right? But I love that. My mother and my father always encouraged me with that. They built me up with that. I wasn't just a child who was, okay, here's your food, there's your room, there's your clothes, do your chores, no hugs, no, no involvement, no interest in anything I did. No, I didn't have that. I had complete interest. It was such a good feeling when I was going to the competition in Utica, New York in October 82, the one that I won, I always show you the picture, right? And right before then, you know, my father was, was, was very much into what I was doing. He encouraged me. And the morning that we left, which was the morning before the prejudging, which where they judge your physique. And then the next day they have the presentation where they hand out the awards. But that morning before, I already had money and he gave me more and he hugged me because he always hugged me. My mother hugged me. They got up out of their sleep because, you know, the guy who owned the gym was coming out to pick me up. And we we're going to make that drive to upstate New York. So they stood there with me and my mother prayed. My father prayed. We held hands. We hugged. Oh, man, that was such a good feeling. And he put some money in my hand. They already gave me money, but he put, put some more in my hand. And he said, son, I know you're going to do good this time, like you always do. Now, I always didn't win, but the feeling that I had where the encouragement that they gave me, the interest that they had in my training and how I was eating. Oh, I see you're low on this particular protein powder. I picked up two more for you. Wow. Do you know what that does for a child? 
And now let me tell you something. You're going to run into individuals who didn't have that. And of course, I'm going to flash that picture again, <laughs> right? But you're going to run into people who didn't have that when they were younger. And they will resent you uh, retroact, no, not retro, uh, retrospect. Yeah, I think it's retrospect, right? Because now you're older, you're already formed, you're a grown adult. And now they're like, you handed us a child and I didn't. You had no, uh, uh, uh. But it builds confidence. And I can't help it. And I tell it to anybody, male or female, I can't help it. If you are insecure because of the voids, I can help to try to encourage you. If you take the position of resenting now, that's energy that you can, can revoke and go the other way to repair yourself and humble yourself and say, hey, could you talk with me about this? I'm having these feelings. Even if you felt jealous of the person, for them having that nurturing and validation and support, and you say, listen, I'm feeling kind of jealous for you, about you, and um, that's not good. Could you please help me not be that way? Could you explain to me why I'm the way I am? I need some help with this. You know, clarity could never be punished. When you're honest, it can never be punished. I remember we were playing in the backyard of my friend, Carlos, across the street, down the block, we were in the backyard. I threw a softball up and it went right through the window and broke it. And we all ran. They ran, right? They were scared for, uh, because of their father. And I ran behind them not to hide. So I went, I spoke to the father after it happened. I said, I'm the one that did it. I went to my father. I said, yes, I was the one that did it. My father said, Thank you for being honest. Anytime my father said, tell the truth, I always told the truth. Now, as I got to be an adult, sometimes I tell a little, you know, <laughs> what I thought were harmless lies. But I don't like to be that way. I like to be brutally honest. And from this point on, I'm just going to have to be that way. Because like I said in yesterday's show and hundreds of other shows that I've done, I am not going to leave this level emotionally constipated. And because of that, I'm enjoying more and more of my life because I don't have these different masks to wear and these different weights to carry around and these different gears to be in where if I'm with this friend, I, I, I got to watch what I say, but I can let it all hang out with this. So when they all come around me, I'm tense because I've been 18 different people or 16 different people like that book and that movie, Sybil, who had 16 personalities. We have a lot of people around here who have 16 personalities and we don't know it. And they show us the one for us that appeals to us the most. But when they go somewhere else, they're doing something else. You ever, ever caught a friend like hanging around their other buddies that maybe you don't hang around and they're saying something or you caught the tail end of a dirty joke that they act like they would never say or something they were doing. They had a cigarette in their mouth and they hide it real quick and they thought you didn't see it or a weed or coming out the crack house. And like, what are you doing coming out of there? Oh, I just had to help my friend bring some things in. No, you were putting a pipe to your face. I got to be transparent. I can't perform like that. I can't just walk around and be all these different people. You know, I say things. I'm unpredictable. I'm off the chain sometimes, but you know, that's my personality. But at the core, you know, I'm a decent person and I'm still working on myself and I still have things that I have to work on really hard because when I get to the point of transition, whenever that may be, you know, I want to be ready in the best version of myself that ever was. I'm not going to procrastinate with that. I would not do that. Number seven, role models, positive role models who demonstrate empathy, kindness, and integrity shape a child's understanding of values and character. You know, growing up, if you grow up around thieves and liars and cheats, then it's a little bit okay for you to do that when you get older because that's all you know. But if you have the integrity, if you have that uh, empathy and kindness and I got that from my parents and I got more of it from my mother. My father had an abundance, but sometimes they, you know, one parent does it a little better than the other. And I'm not soft. I'm not an easy uh, target. And people, they see me sometimes soft-spoken, agreeable, tolerating some things that are uncomfortable to me, but I don't want to say anything. But when now I'm activated and I, I turn into this person and show you the other side. And when I said turn into this other person, I got one personality, but another side of the personality. But I have to say it that way. And oftentimes, and you'll understand this too, you know, when you have to step to somebody and you have to correct them and you have to straighten them out for good. And they kept trying you. Now you have to amp it up to the point where 
it may appear that you're out of character, but you're just totally annoyed. And it's the only language this other person or people speak. See, they kept poking and prodding, poking and prodding. They kept poking the bear. And now they want to paint you as a monster to other people. But see, they'll paint you as a monster to cover themselves from what they've been doing to you all this time. But they will never, ever explain what you did to create the monster. They will never explain and confess what they did to create the monster that you appear to be. They'll only tell that part to make themselves seem innocent. And you know what? I don't care at this point. I'm at the I don't care phase of my life. Even though I turn 61 in a few more days, I can still go and enjoy the old man phase. And I'm not an old man. It's about the energy that you have. It's about how much you have left in the tank. It's about how much you've maintained yourself on a mental and spiritual and physical level, right? But I don't mind, I don't mind, what do I mean by that? I don't mind wearing the polka dot pants and the striped shirts and the purple this and the orange this. and I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna bring attention to myself that way. What I'm saying, I really don't give a damn what people think. I really don't give a damn what people think. I used to care a little bit years ago, but right now when I see how relentless people can be with their masks on and they rip the mask off, aha, I fooled you. I don't like you. I hate you. I was using you. Well, you know what? Not too many people, unless I know them, I have a tight inner circle now. Tight, tight, tight. Sometimes it feels like a choker around my neck, but I'm glad because I know who's who and they're proven products. I'm not accepting any more applications right now in this life unless you're tried and true elsewhere and I get the recommendation from somebody who's on a higher level. You see what I mean? That's the way I do it, right? Opportunities for play and creativity. Playful exploration and creative expression are vital for cognitive, emotional, and social development. I've always said this from many years ago. And I've always questioned why in schools, and it's the schools that we are in, if you know what I mean, why are they taking away the art classes? Why are they taking away uh, things that stoke creative thought, philosophical thought? They remove those things because they understand those who do the oppressing, they understand that most revolutionaries, and I will say all revolutionaries, have the ability to think outside of the box to understand the position that they're put in when they are oppressed. So to stop the revolutionaries who will outthink you, let's take away the stimulus, the classes that create and, and amplify that part of the mind that will bring resistance to them later on. This is why they do that. You must get into creative thinking. When, you, when you're a parent, you just can't tell your child to be a cookie cutter worker. Well, just go to school, get a job, go to the job, be good at the job, follow the rules of the job. You'll never start a business of your own if you don't do that. I mean, wherever I go, people say, oh, the economy is bad here. The economy is bad there. But no matter how bad any economy is, you have people who are doing well. So to do well, you have to think outside the box now, don't you? Right? I ask myself, okay, if everything is so bad, how come that those nice houses are over there and they're well lit and well groomed and have people working in the yard and you know they're making money? How are they doing it? How's that guy driving that big 18-wheeler? He's making money. What is he doing with it? I don't know. You know, this person has this nice big and it's not about being materialistic. What I'm saying is that you have to be able to think around things. And that ability has kept me afloat huh, all my life. I thank you, my, my powerful and beautiful parents, for teaching me life. Even when oftentimes I went off the beaten path, had a, maybe too many girlfriends here and there. But other than that, to, to not make any stupid mistakes that really either took decades off of my life, which in that lifestyle I could have, right? I, I thank God for a clean bloodstream. But other than that, you know, stuff with anger, Anger, hanging around with the wrong people and making the wrong decisions. No, I got a strong mind. And it's getting stronger every day. Yes, I got a strong mind. Don't anybody come out here bragging about, oh, I have a weak mind. But I'll tell you one thing, when it's a weak-minded person with no resolve, you can see it a mile away. 
And you had to put your foot down and say, you know what? Even if you were a person who was a follower, who didn't think for yourself, you got to put your foot down and say, hey, listen, if I make dumb mistakes, I'm going to be the one feeling it. Look, what I eat doesn't fill your stomach. What you eat doesn't fill my stomach. We have to be accountable in this life to know the decisions that we make, we're the ones going to feel it. And the thing is, even if you do something dumb and end up in jail and you did something with 10 other people and they end up in the same jail cell temporarily in the holding cell, you're not going through that experience on your own because one of those folks is going to snitch you out. You're going to have a longer sentence, right? They're going to have a shorter sentence. You're going to say, why do they have a shorter sentence? Because they snitched you out, but you thought they were down with you, whatever. And whatever it is you do, you are born alone. You're going to transition alone. You can be with people, walk alongside people, but you have to have your own mind to make your own decisions. That's one thing that I know about myself. That's one thing that I know about myself. When people were making all this money in the crack trade and I was going to the gym, hey man, you can hang with me. You know, you can protect me because you big and strong. No, I don't want any part of that money. I'd work whatever jobs that I did and I love life knowing that nobody's going to knock my door down and put guns in my face and take me away like a slave to another plantation, the plantation called incarceration. No, no way. And that's why sometimes folks look at me. You grew up in New York City and, and you, you didn't go through this and go through that. I went through a few things, but nothing major. And yes, you see things and I have the ability to learn through other people's mistakes. And that's what we have to do. But it comes from that thinking over and above. You know, I was speaking to a dear friend who's building a home in the motherland. And she was telling me that in this process of everything, uh, they have a person who can show the completed house, even though the construction hasn't started, and it can show them the inside. And it's like, you know, 3D. Well, I think that way. How many times have you gotten a drone and flew it over your house and you see your house from an angle that you never saw it? Well, I had that ability in life, me personally, not just seeing a physical structure, but seeing potential situations. I'll see a particular young lady and already know what she wants to do with me. And I don't mean sexually. I mean, she may try to throw that at me, but she has another motivation of something she's trying to get out of me. So I can think above what is presented to me. I can look down and see and look in and see from a drone's perspective, wherever I want to put it. Lots of times my own desire blinded my good judgment. Yes, I admit that because I'm human, but I learned from it. You have to learn from these things. Number nine, education and intellectual stimulation. Access to quality education and intellectual stimulation nurtures curiosity, critical thinking, and a lifelong love of learning. Mwah! That's me, a lifelong love of learning, critical thinking and curious. I want to learn. Just because you're out of school doesn't mean you should lose your desire to learn. You should be better every year, every subsequent year than you were the prior year, a better version of yourself. Well, most people purchase vehicles when they can, as they need. Some people don't want them. They're too expensive. But let's just say, hey, you went and bought a Toyota Corolla. You say, I'm going to buy a Toyota Corolla. It's a small vehicle. It's easy on gas. You know, they have a strong engine that lasts as long as you maintain it. And this is 2024, right? It's early 2024. We're not going to see 2025 models around, right? So imagine you go into the dealership and you say, yes, I'm going to get this brand new 2024 Toyota Corolla. And you plan on keeping it for many years because you know that if you maintain it, it'll give you 5, 10, 15, 20 years of unscathed service, right? And you walk up into the dealership and you see the brand new Camrys, you see the, the brand new truck, the Tundra, you see all these different things is next door to a, a Lexus dealership because Lexus and Toyota, the same thing basically, right? And then you go, you say, I, I wanna see the Toyota Corolla. And they bring you over to the Toyota Corolla and they show you a 1984 model. Looks new, but it's a 1984 model. They're looking at you like, what's wrong with you? This is a new car. Nobody ever drove it. No, but you want the 2024 model. So imagine after all these years, you knew something and you met them again after so many years, after 40 years. 
and they talk the same way they did 40 years ago, it would be a great disappointment, right? So you want to make yourself better every single year. You're expecting to see something new and newer. It could look very similar, but let it look new because it's supposed to be new. So when you talk with me, I'm supposed, I can go back and tell the same jokes. We can reminisce on things way back, but I can bring you up to par to who I am now. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And I look forward to being a better version of myself in 2025. Creator willing for me to be here on this earth and on this plane. 2026, 27. I want to build wisdom. I want to learn things. I want to relearn things and see deeper into situations that I couldn't see as deep into before because I wasn't the person that I am now. So let's revisit this family situation. Let's revisit this toxic friendship or let's revisit a relationship that broke up at that particular time. I didn't know why, but now with a wiser mind, I can see certain factors and say, oh, wow, this is what happened. So in essence, when you have something happen, don't tear your hair out when you don't get answers right away. Sometimes the answers don't come for a long time. Sometimes the answers don't come for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and it's not because you're racking your brains. It just comes to you. You might be at the red light and hear a particular song that reminds you of an old relationship from 20 or 30 years ago, or whatever your age is. And you never knew why she broke up with you or he broke up with you. But with your wisdom now, it just comes out. Before your mind was constipated with emotion and you wanted to force it, but now you weren't expecting that answer to come to you and it just eased on out. And you're like, wow, that's why. But the only way to elevate yourself and have that ability is to continue to learn about you, study you, meditate with you from within, and ask your own questions about what you feel. If you feel any voids, why? What can I do to fulfill these voids? Instead of de depending on somebody else who doesn't really have an obligation to you, even when they say it, they can even marry you and talk about, I want a divorce and they're gone. You have a responsibility to yourself to keep your emotional, mental, and physical vehicle tuned up and ready for the, for the journey of life. Number 10, stability and consistency. Consistent caregiving and a stable living environment provide the foundation for trust and emotional security. It, we basically said that earlier, but they're saying stability and consistency. Consistent caregiving. I mean, you care for a child, they get to be 12 years old and you start abusing them. Then what good was the prior 12 years? You know what I mean? You got to be consistent with it. And you also have to upgrade it. It can't be the same. No, you shouldn't be doing it anyway. You should talk to them. Yes, in a nice voice, in a way that they can digest the words if they don't understand it. But, you know, simple and, and bump it up a little bit. But be consistent in how you care for them. You have to be. When I worked in corrections, the only way I got the respect of those who were there temporarily or for a long time is because I was consistent in how I dealt with them. I was respectful of them. I wasn't scared of them. I was respectful of them. I didn't want them to be scared of me. Just show me respect. It has nothing to do with the uniform. It has nothing to do with the status. It has nothing to do with what the world says you are, who you think you are. But we are supposed to give each other respect. And when you break that respect, then I don't have to respect you. I don't have to deal with you. And here's another thing. Don't be afraid to delete people out of your life. You don't have to sit here and babysit these people. Oh, they're stressing me because they're not treating me right. And no. If you sniff a violation, boom, you're gone. Delete and block. It's easy to do with the push of a button on a computer, on a social media platform, or your smartphone or your tablet. But usually we don't do, do that. We think of reasons why we have to keep these people hanging around. Well, they were friends for 50 years of my life, for 20 years of my life. They gave me that loan three years ago. I paid it back, but no. Why do we do this? Be consistent that way. You are your priority. You need to fly high and fly light consistently in life. 
you know the cargo uh, analogy I always use when a plane realizes it doesn't have that much fuel to make landfall. Cargo plane. So everything it's carrying is going to bring it down into the water. Would that be smart? No, you got to get rid of that cargo, make the plane lighter so it can fly lighter and make it to shore. We're trying to make it to the next level, not carry people with us that mean it's no good. Especially when you know it. Why are you doing this? You're hurting yourself. And they're getting a free ride and they're getting a free ride and use of your life force for their benefit. They're sucking from you. And when you crash and when you get down in the water, they're going to jump out with their parachutes. Bye. Thank you for letting me use you. <laughs> you fool. Oh, no. No way. <laughs> That's a separate show on its own. The impact of unmet, unmet needs. Unfortunately, when these foundational needs are unmet or inadequately addressed in childhood, individuals may grapple with profound feelings of emptiness and longing seeking to fill the void through various means in adulthood. And what are they? Let's, let's just, it's vast. But let's talk about a few of them. Seeking validation through sex. Come on now. Some individuals may mistakenly equate physical intimacy with love and belonging, engaging in superficial relationships or casual encounters in a quest for validation and connection. Struggles with anger and resentment, feelings of inadequacy and resentment toward those who experienced a more nurturing upbringing, we spoke about that, can lead to unresolved anger issues and difficulties in interpersonal relationships. Hey, you can be in a relationship. You can, you can, you can be a man with a woman, woman with a man, and, and you feel there's a love there, but there's always a, also a resentment there because they kind of resent you because of the way you were raised. But you're laying in the bed with them, you're paying bills together, you married them or you're on your way to being married, maybe you're living to get whatever, that's your business. But there's this resentment that they have against you. And sometimes you can catch the expression on their face when they're looking at you. You're like, wait a second, they look like they hate me. And it's fleeting because they didn't have what you had. And they see how empty they are. And instead of saying, hey, you know, I need you to help me with this. They just sit there and they resent you. And if they don't deal with it, it's going to be the end of your relationship. And the relationship may last a long time, but it won't go to the heights that it should go to. That resentment is going to affect so many different facets of your relationship. And on the outside, you can smile and go to the functions. Oh, you're such a good couple. You look so good together. Oh, my God. You can post for the selfies and put it up on social media. And when, when you break up because of this problem that's been going on, Everybody's in shock because you are fronting. You put more energy to look like the real thing instead of being the real thing. You know, we dismiss that check engine light when we're driving. Man, I've been driving for the last two years with that check engine light. And the very, the very time when you need the car to work, <laughs> you way up in the mountains somewhere, 40 miles away from a gas station, but it's not a gas problem. It just cocks out of you. And you're sitting here, what? I wonder what happened. It was working so good before. Yes, it was working good in dysfunction and you didn't address the dysfunction. So now the dysfunction rears its ugly head to the fullest and you're stuck on a mountain and there's bears around and all kind of noises you hear. You got to make a number two and a number one, but you're afraid to get out of your vehicle. So you sit there in your mess until daybreak and, and daytime comes. How sad. You better acknowledge it. You better know what it can do. Self-medication and substance abuse. The pain of unmet emotional needs may drive individuals to seek temporary relief through substance abuse, leading to dependency and further exacerbating emotional distress. Of course. You think people use drugs just because, oh, it's like candy. It tastes good. They're hurting. They're running away from something. There's a void. There's a pain. And then they get hooked and they start liking the high because it takes them to a different place. And that's the thing that they do to get away from it. Hey, this is a shortcut. I don't have to work on and face the things inside of me or face the things that were done to me, the trauma. And it's sad. Because sometimes and oftentimes they get so caught up in this thing of self-medicating their whole life. Huh, that they never see any other way out. It's too easy to stick the needle in their arm, sniff something, take a pill. 
suck on some liquid or whatever it is they do. I don't know nothing about drugs. I mean, I know about it because we all know through what happens and there's a lot of information out there. If you don't know anything about drugs, just don't do it. And I don't want to hear, I don't want it's not like Nancy Reagan back then. Just don't do it. But her husband, Ronald Reagan, was allowing the borders open to bring drugs into the country. And she's talking this other stuff, please. But just don't even get into that world. Face what's inside of you. No matter how much pain it is, you know the real pain is to know that you were self-medicating and now addicted to drugs for so many years in your life and you really wake up one day older and you say, man, I spent my whole life doing this thing, running away from something that started out as a check engine light light that I could have took it into the shop and corrected it. It was a minor issue. Now I'm stuck on the side of the road. You see what I mean? It's very important to do this. Very, very important. Challenges with commitment and infidelity. Without a model of healthy, committed relationships, individuals may struggle to maintain fidelity, seeking validation and emotional fulfillment outside of their primary partnerships. Yes. And it seems like the whole damn world is doing this. I'm not saying just that, but they used to have little surveys and uh, what's the magazine there? Um, Oh, it's a white woman's magazine. I used to read everything, right? Oh, Cosmopolitan, Cosmopolitan. I used to love Cosmopolitan. They spoke on human nature, uh, nature issues. It wasn't just a black thing, but, you know, I can look past the fluff and, you know, uh, 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 30 days to make your breast look perky. I wasn't reading those articles. <laughs> you know what I mean? But when it came to relationships and things of trauma and things of dysfunction, they had some good, they had some good articles. Look, Playboy magazine had some good articles. Oh, man, y'all know why you're looking at that magazine. You're trying to look at the centerfold, man. You want to look at them women. I brushed through there and looked. But really, on an intellectual level, I wanted to read what was, that was more valuable to me. It's not going to make me better to say, oh, you know, three years ago, uh, I saw this magazine with this lady with her breasts hanging out. Man, it made me such a better person. And you can get stuck into that. Porn addiction, just like self-medication, is a different thing. Where are you going with this thing? How is it making you better? You're draining yourself. You're weakening yourself. You're making it able where you're not, you, you, you're not able to talk to women in a healthy way because you see them one way. All these spectacular, colorful, dynamic porn scenes. You bump into a woman on a bus stop and she looks at you and licks her lips. And now you see the scene where she's in the back giving you oral sex. Now you go on the bus stop. You think everybody's like that. You're all messed up in the head because of what you've been indulging in. And do you think that you have both hands on the keyboard when you're watching this stuff? Come on, y'all. Family signs, jaw, Vaseline gone in two weeks. Don't, don't even try to lie to me. Miss me with that. <laughs> that's what it is but they used to have surveys you know different numbers about infidelity or you know 27% of all men consider it and 12% actually do it now maybe it wasn't that low but then you have women looking at their men uh, are you part of that 12% oh no honey nobody's going to admit to that but I remember those numbers were a certain way now I couldn't tell you what it is now because it depends on race and status and uh, geographical, you know, location. So I don't know how to do these surveys, but now the numbers are big. 67% of all women. Like what? What? <laughs> 92 of all percent of all men. And how many men would refuse? Even when they think that they're happy at home. And some gorgeous woman is like, listen, ain't nobody around, baby. You know, um, Let's play around a little bit. And a lot of them are not going to be like, hamada, 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 like Ralph Cramden. No, they're not. They're going to be like, okay, let's go on over here. Yeah, no problem. Let's, let's do this thing. Not knowing what they're letting into their life. You got to be careful. <laughs> you got to be careful. Navigating the path to healing. While the repercussions of childhood deficiency in love and stability are profound, healing and growth are possible through self-awareness, introspection, and intentional efforts towards self-care and healing. Therapeutic intervention, seeking support from trained therapists or counselors can provide valuable insight and tools for addressing unresolved childhood wounds and developing healthier coping mechanisms. Look, it's tough when we realize that maybe we were born into a situation that left us deficient, right? 
but we got to be the ones to correct that. So there's a lot of resentment. Like, yeah, they should be the ones to apologize and correct everything. And it's not going to happen oftentimes because you realize that, you know, oftentimes our caregivers or our parents, they got their own issues too. They've been through trauma too, you know, and, and they brought you into the world and tried their best. And it's not where people are going to say, well, I have my stuff perfect now and now we can move. No, it's not always like that. We got to be careful, right? Build healthy relationships, cultivating genuine connections based on mutual respect, trust, and open communication can gradually replace patterns of dysfunction with healthy relational dynamics. How many times have you seen a person who went for a job and you said, they're not going to get that job. They too messed up in the head. They did 20 years in the pen, smoking crack all their life. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm amping it up, but they got hired because that person and human resources and that administrator saw something in them. And because they were brought maybe into a healthy atmosphere on that job, which <laughs> how many jobs have a healthy atmosphere, right? But let's just say they do. And they're greeted every morning. And they're treated with respect. And they're acknowledged for what they do on the job. And they have a feeling of self-worth. And it changes them. And you don't see them for a while. But after a year, you see them again and there's a different glow. They have a sense of belonging there. They were built up there because of the atmosphere. That could be anywhere. I'm just using that as an example because I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen on jobs. All jobs aren't bad. But there's always toxic people who try to infiltrate that goodness and start mess. But I've seen it. I've really, really seen it. Self-compassion and forgiveness. Practicing self-compassion and forgiveness towards oneself for past mistakes and shortcomings is essential for fostering inner healing and self-acceptance. Sometimes we don't forgive ourselves for the things that we've experienced, experienced and been through. The state of mind that we were in, the place where we were in at that time. Of course, you may make a bad decision because you weren't equipped with the right choices. But you can't keep riding yourself your whole life. And listen, if a person is in your life now as a friend or a lover or a committed relationship or whatever, they're, they're close to you. It's not like they're a stranger, right? Well, if they keep bringing up the past to keep you down, you need to get rid of them. If they keep bringing up the past, well, you know, when 20 years ago, you was out there on a the stroll, you know, you, you, you was a prostitute. So don't come at me with that. Are they a person there to build you up? They should never bring that up again. Or, or in your intimate conversations, and it's like, listen, sweetheart, you really came a long way. But you know what? Even back then, I saw something in you. Look at you now. Because you are not that label. You were just going through something at the time. And the decisions you made were based on your atmosphere and all that you knew at that particular time. But you've grown. Build them up. But you have some people that want to keep you in that spot to use you, to keep your esteem low. I speak from experience. I'm not saying I've been the one trapped in somebody bringing up the past because if I went by my past, <laughs> I wouldn't think highly of myself at all. I do. I mean, as far as women and all of that stuff. No. No. Never let somebody define you by the things that you reveal to them. They want to keep you in that place. That's wrong. Don't even argue with them. Ease away from them because they're not good for you. Mindfulness, mindfulness and emotional regulation. Engaging in mindfulness practices and developing emotional regulation skills can help individuals navigate challenging emotions and responses more effectively. You have to because you're going to be tried in this world. You better know how to emotionally regulate and practice the mindfulness and know what's going on in the moment to know, well, if I make a dumb decision and punch this man in the face because I'm angry at something dumb he said, now he hit his head on the concrete and died, what, is, what good is that going to do me? The best is to avoid and don't get hit with the foolishness. Stay away from foolish people that will make you do foolish things. If you got to stay away from them, cross the street, Ignore them, build a wall 20 feet high <laughs> between where you live. So you don't have to see these fools. Do what you got to do to live your life because it's your life and it was given to you 
and no one has the right to interfere into it to cause you to do something to really mess yourself up. But you, in your mind, in your awareness, you are your first line of defense. You always have to tally in and remember this decision I'm about to do now. How is it going to affect me in the future? Don't just get into a rage because pe people can manipulate you into that. And after you do it, the guy, maybe the guy didn't die, but he's on the ground now. His nose is bloody. He knocked out his teeth and he's on his cell phone now, his smartphone, calling the cops laughing. You just hit the lottery or you have all this money. He's like, <laughs> you fool. I don't like you, but you know what? I'll take your money and your home and you'll be locked up. Ha, ha, ha. That's how venomous people are. Let me tell you something. I just found out. I just found out from someone. I'm not going to tell you the circumstances. But someone actually say or said they literally hate me. They didn't just say I hate him. No, no. They said, make no doubt. I hate Lance. He thinks he's all that. I can't stand him. I can't stand seeing him. I hate him. I hate everything about him. Now, this person doesn't have much going on in their life, and I can understand why. And I never treated this person bad or whatever, but they want to come off and kneel me and whatever. Cut them off. Now they hate you even more. They hate your progress. You see what I mean? You got to be careful out here. Stop judging the world by the state of your own mind where you know that I'm not going to get so roused up to want to hate somebody. That doesn't mean somebody won't think that way about you. But it's good to know. Because you think I'll take a meal from that person? You'll think I want to take a late night drive with that person? I mean, I wouldn't anyway. But there are people out here feeling all kind of things for no reason except for the things that they didn't get when they were a child or the voids they feel now in the present because of that. That was That's a heavy thing. If you really knew the circumstances, it's crazy. Seeking meaning and purpose. Exploring personal values, interests, and goals can provide a sense of purpose and direction. Anchoring individuals in a deeper sense of fulfillment and belonging. If you seek meaning in things and have a purpose in life, goals, things you reach for, that flavors every single day. I'm amazed at the opportunities for growth. I'm amazed at the things I'm going to learn. I'm going to teach myself some things tonight. I'm excited about that because that was one of my goals when I woke up this morning. Okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But at the end of the day, I'm going to learn something. Wow. That's a beautiful thing. That's a really, really beautiful thing. In conclusion, the impact of love and nurturing home environments in childhood reverberates far beyond the formative years. We spoke about that. Shaping the trajectory of one's life and relationships by acknowledging the significance of these foundational elements and addressing the wounds of the past with compassion and intentionality, individuals can embark on a journey of healing, reclaiming their sense of self and worth, belonging, and fulfillment. Total restoration if you do things right. This is very much a beautiful thing. And it was a beautiful thing for you to sit here for the time that we spoke. I just want to say I love you all. I have love in my heart, but I'm going to have love in my heart for myself and my loved ones also. And I will defend to the end whatever it takes. So you choose how, what side of me you get. But you have a right to this life. Nobody is supposed to hurt you. And you're supposed to thrive. And I know you will. We're all seeking that which in the dark. You see? to turn the light on to get more enlightenment. And if we keep trying, we will definitely get it. Love you all. Landscurve.com. On to the next one. Subscribe, like, share, thumbs it up, whatever you want to do. And if not, thanks for being here and thanks for your viewership. Peace.
make sure to go to landscurve.com and online so hello this is Marta. actually today i i i got to meet my friend lance yes i got to meet my friend lance this is my first time meeting him in person and he's a very kind man seriously i do talk with him on phone like on phone on whatsapp but i've never got to meet him but today it's just extraordinary he's very like anything you want to know about life anything you want to know about just him on just like anything you want to know about life please youtube telegram instagram twitter all the social media channels you got to find him there he's very inspiring he's very positive if you want anything positive about life please subscribe to landscape and then every day you got to see different videos different talks different topics about life see you make sure to go to landscurve.com an online magazine established in 2001 containing written articles thousands of talk shows and discussions cutting edge cartoons as well as erotic expressions and tasteful adult photography. It's definitely not for the faint of heart. Once you get a taste of the world of Lance Curve, trust me, you'll be back for more. LanceGurve.com, bold, raw, and uncut.